Uh, my name is Tom Brady. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. All right, then I won't use the mic, but you can go like this if other speakers you cannot hear them. Yeah, use, the use the mic. All right. My mic sounds nice, check one. How's that? <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Tom Brady, and I'm the director of the Commonwealth Honors Program. You have a real treat. Uh, ahead of you, uh, these honors students have been working all semester, and I really want to make it about them. So without further ado, one of the ways that I thought we could get started is to just move down the line and have each student introduce themselves and tell you their academic program. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica and I am in nursing. My name is Trisha and I'm in psychology. My name is Kathleen and I'm in general studies. My name is Jason and I'm in liberal arts, math and science. My name is Eliana Lopes, I'm a criminal justice major. I'm Rich Rangel and I'm an engineering transfer. Pauline Murray, human services. Sarah Nelson, general studies, mass transfer. Tom Chilio, clinical lab science. Katie Gallagher, business transfer. Caitlin Pike, criminal justice. Nicole Makuchi, human services. I'm Owen Galton, liberal arts, math and science. Thank you. So as you can see, we have a very diverse group of students who've been working on this problem all semester. So to give you some background and talk about our process and then go into our solutions that we, that the students want to present to the president, I hand it off to... Katie? We're going to start the video first. Oh, okay. survival or death and sometimes the person holding the gun is their neighbor and sometimes it's their congressman or their alderman who's not doing enough to help them the line is where you were always in a position to give to give help and then for the first time this line of I've gone from being somebody who could help to being somebody who needs help certain amount of pride that comes in being independent and there's a certain amount of shame that comes into having to beg for every little thing that you get $23,000 is no money nearly and yet I could still see families who make $35,000 who are still poor, who are still about to lose their home, who still can't afford groceries. When you start trying to tell people about poverty, they start making excuses and, and making heartless statements about why people are in poverty and they don't even have a clue. They don't even have a clue. Some of the most prevalent and damaging stereotypes about poor people are that they're lazy, that they're stupid, they don't have any skills, prefer poverty, that they can't take care of their families. Uh, poor people are working harder just trying to keep their heads above water than we, than we can even imagine. It's just, it's, it's hard. It doesn't matter if you have to stand in line and kind of feel bad about yourself, that you're a failure, you have to cross that line to be able to keep the lights on, to be able to keep feeding your kids. That could be you without a house, wondering if they're going to go put you out. 
but for the grace of God. Because a lot of these people had jobs, have degrees, did everything right. But the bottom fell out. And that bottom was that line. They went below that line. We are the first President's Honors Panel to exist at BCC. And as such, we thought it was important to include a narrative so that we could share our process. President Sprague presented the panel with this question. What challenges to BCC's service area are associated with high levels of poverty? And what role should BCC play in addressing those challenges? This was a first experience for many of us with problem-based learning. <coughs> PBL encourages the development of research skills, analytical thinking, and identifying and utilizing the strengths and weaknesses of one's peers through group work. One of the first things we were asked to do was create a personal audit that highlighted our own strengths and weaknesses, as well as included any relevant information or experience that we might have in regards to poverty. We were divided into three groups. The macro group, which collected data on a state and nationwide level, the micro group, which focused on collecting data in our service area, and the BCC group, which analyzed data pertaining to BCC and its existing programs. We gathered info, information regarding poverty levels, educational attainment, available aid, and case studies. We eventually used this information to identify and define the challenges that faced the South Coast regarding poverty. One of the issues that was raised in the group was whether or not community service should be a mandatory part of this program. Many of us are already involved in volunteering both on campus and in outside organizations, so eventually it was decided to leave the issue of volunteerism up to personal discretion. The group had several contentious moments when people were expected to let go of issues that they felt strongly about in favor of issues that were, that were favored by the majority of the panel. We also laughed a lot and learned to work effectively and objectively to create a document that we're immensely proud to have our names on. So defining poverty, this was the first obstacle that we had to work on as a group. You know, agreeing on, on what poverty is is not as easy as you may think to, to you know, start off with. It means different things to different people and one of the things that we struggled with was defining, differentiating uh, extreme poverty and the poverty that we face in the U.S. So essentially we ended up agreeing on the Census Bureau and its definition that the poverty line in the U.S. is $22,000 or thereabouts. So we're going to ask you guys to show us, you know, it's, it's one of these things where we want to break down the stigma. And we want to show of hands of how many people have actually crossed that poverty line. So it's important to say you did nothing wrong. Um, <coughs> it's not your fault. The stigma is wrong. Poverty is evidence of a problem. It's not the problem. And that's a quote from Marshall Gantz. The problem is the cycle of poverty. All right? Which one? Which comes first? Is it? Poor health, poor education, unemployment, livable wages. What we know is education is one of the best tools to fight poverty. But as we can see, in this area, 30% of individuals, 25 and older, are without a high school diploma. And these 30% the, these are leading our young people. You know, they make impacting statements about what education is. And how do we reach out to these young people and stop this cycle? What we can see with this, this resources chart is that services alone, so the blue, you see services are, are what we're providing for people that are struggling with poverty. But every service that we're providing, there's a red expense associated with this. So naturally, the cycle spins and people struggle to get out. But there is help. There is help. As you can see, all of these things that you can see on your screen is things that BCC is doing, things that we have in practice here. Thank you to President Sprague, to things that are fundamentals. We have 
courses, we have things that will bring those who are at that line of poverty, they'll bring them into the college and help them rise above. But the question that we're challenged with is if we offer all of this, where, where is it going? Are we reaching our target area? Are we reaching those that we can't see? That's, that's the problem. So the challenge. A lot is being done. You know, we saw that slide. That's, that slide is just some of what we're doing to help people in poverty. But the fact is that in this area, the poverty rate is double even the rate for Massachusetts. So we're at 22%. The state is at 11%. So Fall River and New Bedford, what can we do to impact this, this cycle? Right, Tom, mind you, th that's just the percentage of people who we can see, those are who are documented. We still have immigrants who we don't know are out there. We call those the invisible people, but they're a majority of those who are impoverished. $65 billion in government resources remain unclaimed. Why? Is it that we're not, we're not targeting those people? They don't know where to get the help to get that money. And if the government has that money, why aren't those in poverty reaching out? It's as well that uh, the average student parent enrolled full-time at, at uh, college receives an annual um, tax return of three to five grand but they usually don't claim it because they figure I don't work enough, I don't pay enough taxes, I'm not gonna get money back, and so they miss out on that, on that payment. That could really help them stay in school. So we began to you know, develop some solutions, looking at all these issues. You know, there's gotta be a solution that we can use scholarship to, to figure out. And as we compiled the data, we found several knowledge gaps, like why is there a perceived communication breakdown between providers and people in need. This was something that we struggled with. Can we prove that there's actually a communication breakdown? And you look around, you know, you, you go to the enrollment center and you see somebody struggling. struggling. They want help with um, financial aid and they, they don't know where to begin. And somebody at the at enrollment will hand them a, you know, a small business size card. Um, just notice, oh, okay, there's a class that you can go into and and they'll give you some help on how to fill out that FAFSA survey. Well, you know, let's do an independent study. Let's find out if there's a more effective way to reach out to that person. What if, what if they walk out and they never return? Um, that, that's the loss that, that we're facing. So we have a, it's clear. We, we see the data. We have a population in need. There are excellent services, but benefits go unclaimed. How do we improve this dialogue? That's the question. So one of our solutions is about a goal-based achievement system called the coaching system. And uh, what we envision this, envision this as is a multi-layered approach. So there would be a floor staff, and this would, uh, these people would greet our target population, or people in poverty, um, as they enter BCC, maybe for the first time, maybe for the first few times. And ideally, these people would be either volunteers, hopefully at the college, majoring in psychology, human services, or people who have strong interpersonal skills who feel passionate about helping others, ideally others in poverty. And so they would greet and guide our target population uh, to anything that they need. And from there, these people would work with a personal coach. And this coach would be trained in knowing the specifics, uh, the specific psychological impacts of poverty. Our research has come across uh, that people in poverty suffer from depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, but especially shame. And so when they enter BCC, they may feel discouraged already or feel like they have nowhere to go. They may feel like they're on their last straw. And the idea is that by greeting them with this group of friendly faces, that they will feel empowered and supported right from the beginning to feel that they are special enough to pursue an education or to do what they need to do. And so by working with this personal coach who would be professionally trained, um, they, would, they would be able okay. <laughs> they, they would be able to work with uh, these individuals in poverty and to target what resources did they need because people in poverty are going to need help financially with a variety of different things. Say they have strugg they're struggling to pay their rent on time. Well, the person uh, or the coach at BCC could help them with utilizing this, the things that they could uh, benefit from at BCC, but also at the community at large. 
So they can point them to the federal resources and the state resources. Maybe they know that some exist, but there are actually a lot out there um, that people in poverty may not be aware of. And also, malnutrition is a huge problem. Um, so the mobile food market, they could direct them there. It's a great program that we're already doing here at BCC um, and going from there. And the other part of the coaches system would involve advocacy, ideally from the students um, or interns um, or graduates, again, from the local community. And the advocacy would help to break down these common misconceptions of people living in poverty, such as um, they may, may feel entitled to what they have, um, et cetera. And from the spread of our research that we've already done, we can help to kind of debunk these myths in the community. We can help these people to feel more welcome and uh, feel like others can approach them and that they can feel supported um, at BCC. And the last part of our advocacy would be sustainable business practices and talking about that. Because if we can funnel our resources economically, whatever that we can, into the local uh, businesses here, that could help to strengthen the South Coast and bolster the job prospects for the future, which the bottom line is everyone could benefit from. That could help these individuals in poverty see the end of the tunnel, so to speak, so that they're more encouraged to finish their graduation program. <coughs> And also that could increase our retention rate um, and graduation uh, rates at Bristol Community College because then this could become a self-sustaining cycle where people see that once the South Coast is improving, um, other businesses may potentially want to move in and we can help to make this flourish again if we think um, with a, a great advocacy approach. So to tell you more about the outreach, I'll hand you over to Pauline. All right, the uh, outreach that we're talking about in no way means to undermine what BCC already does. In our research, we found out that um, BCC already did an awful lot to address the challenges that are in our area governed in high poverty. The outreach that we're talking about would be once everything was centralized in, in a uniform brand with the uh, survey and having professional coaches would be going out and actually face-to-face -face contact with people that are dealing with the hardships of poverty whether that's at a food pantry, passing out flyers, just letting, giving some poverty awareness and explaining that education is an option. Anything that would draw them in for the sake of recruitment and retainment. What we did discover is that once, that once they're here, we already have, we're already in an area of high poverty and we already have students that are already dealing with the, those issues that all students face, uh, whether you're in poverty or not, whether it's stress, finances, family issues, all the things that come down, when, and including time restraint, you know, trying to get everything done, be in class on time, make sure you got your papers turned in. But when you're dealing with high poverty issues, you're also dealing with needing to get papers down to the daycare office so you don't lose your slot for daycare while you got a test in English and, and are you going to make it to that test because you got to get these papers there. So as we started talking about the outreach and uh, using civic engagement and service learning, and there's a lot of studies that are out there. Tulane University after Katrina did a study on uh, students that engaged in civic engagement, service learning, internships in their first semesters in school were more likely to graduate. And uh, so by utilizing the students here in the outreach program, it would not only help their att attainment of their own personal goals, but would also help those coming in. But with this, it addressed other challenges. And to address those challenges, let's start with Rich. All right, so after we have the coaches in place and we're reaching out to our community and trying to pull people in, um, we're gonna try to subsidize some basic life courses. They might not be ready to take on a full, a full course load or even commit to a degree program. They might just wanna, they might have to catch up. And um, so these skills would be something essential for someone climbing out of poverty. Um, it'd be classes like basic reading and writing, math, computer literacy, time and money management, and resume building. Um, helping people to improve on these will definitely help them find opportunities and options for employment, prepare them for further education, and make them more likely to be involved in the community. Um, our hope is that with these classes, students will learn how to lay a foundation for a successful, responsible adult adulthood by using time effectively, setting goals, avoiding procrastination, uh, overcoming feelings of inadequacy, and developing self-motivation. You've heard tons of wonderful things that we can implement. 
One of the solutions that we found that could answer the above questions was single stop. Single stop currently around us is, takes place at Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill has this one office. It says it in its name. It's one place where the student can go to get answers to many different things. It's one place, one face. We know that community college students, there's more to them. There's more to their life. We don't come here and go back home and that's our day. We come here. We go to, we go to school. We're parents. Most of us are at that time, at that, almost crossing that poverty line where we say, is it, is it for me? Can I sit here and can I do this? But if you have that one place, that one person that can say, you, you got this, you can do it. Stay in school, I'm gonna support you. One of the things that Single Stop does, as you see, is the, it has a four-tier model. Benefits, with the benefits, when you come into their office, within 15 minutes, within 15 minutes they can tell you, okay, you qualify, for food assistance, you qualify for cash assistance, you qualify for a daycare voucher, anything. And that's 15 minutes out of your time. You can do that as you're going into another class. You don't have to leave here and go and sit in an office for four hours and be told, you gotta go back home and get all the paperwork that you need and bring it in tomorrow. That's another class that you're missing. That's, that, that's just, it's, it's depressing. It's depressing that you can go into an office and sit there and be told you need to walk away and come back. And maybe when you come back, you'll see a different person. But with single stop, you have that one person, that one face. Free tax preparation, an amazing, amazing thing. As we all know, it's pretty pricey to do your taxes. And not everyone knows about the different things that you qualify for. As Jason had mentioned, a single mom could qualify for three to five thousand dollars. And if she doesn't know that, if she doesn't have that one person to walk her through that, how does she know she qualifies for that? We had Kathleen O'Neill from Bunker Hill come in and speak to the class. She gave us an example of a student who walked in her office and she's like, oh, did you do your taxes? She's like, no, I don't qualify. I didn't make enough money. She's like, go home. You don't have your paperwork. Go home. Come back tomorrow and come see us. That one person qualified for, I believe it was $4,000. And she was at the point where she was ready to have her lights turned off. If you can take that person and change their life and do something for that like them and walk them through that, per, that process and you can give them $3,000, how much money it is that they're getting, you take a, a weight off their shoulder. When you're taking a weight off their shoulder, they have the opportunity to focus on classes and do what they're here to do, succeed and graduate. Um, the legal services, I'm going to go off of Bunker Hill's model. They do not have a legal person, a, a lawyer or anything like that, a part-time person there. But because of their role in the school, they can call a nonprofit agency and get that information. Another example was that she had a student who was having immigration issues. She wasn't legal, but she wanted to continue her education. And because her parents wasn't le weren't legal, she also wasn't le legal. So she took her in her office, and she was able to contact the person and tell her, OK, first thing, go home and speak to your parents about what you're here to talk to me about. Your parents, everyone needs to be on the same boat. There's no pressure. She told her that, okay, let me, let me walk you through the pr process. Come in and bring your paperwork, and she did. And within that, she told her, okay, do not pay anyone else. We're gonna tell you who you need to pay and what you need to see and what you need to do, which to me is amazing. Again, that one person. Financial. Single stop can, not only are they allowing you to get the benefits that you need, but they will take you in and offer you a class or some type Bring everyone together for a budgeting. If you're here and you're going to class and you have money, if you're not budgeting, you're going to go nowhere. You're, you, if you spend too much money on Dunkin' Donuts, on Starbucks, it's pointless because that money could be going towards some, somewhere else. And if you don't know where to bring your money or what to put your money towards, it's a downfall. Um, BC, BCC, single stop, the, the way that we look at it, it's, it's going to pay for itself. There's different grants out there that the colleges can apply to, and they'll get, they'll get success. And that's what we need. We need somewhere, something in this college to say, okay, come here. I'm going to support you through the whole thing, not turning away our backs. Because when you turn your back on someone, like they said, they won't come back. And if you're turning your back at the community college, where are they going to go? This is where everyone comes to get an education despite everything else in their life. They're here at the community college because they don't have the time. They don't have the means to go to a bigger school. Thank you. Jason. Thank you, Eliana. Um, solution steps, solutions one through five are um, mainly to pull people out of poverty. Solution six uh, is increasing voc vocational training. This is 
actually a step to prevent poverty. So it's a little different than other solutions. Um, <clears throat> We can prevent poverty by educating our local uh, high school and middle school students. Um, all we have to do is inform them of the, of the widening skills gap and, and to work hard to reduce the stigma of pursuing a vocational trade. Um, vocational trades just have a stigma. If you say you're going to school to do a vocational trade, people ask you, why can't you go to an educational, I mean, um, an academic college? And there's it's just viewed down upon. I don't have to tell you guys. I'm sure you all know. Um, and we currently send representatives to high schools to talk about transferring to Bristol Community College. So this step would be so easy. It, it's just adding a little bit into the spiel. In recent decades, our manufacturing fishing industries have been lost to healthcare, education services, business services, and retail trade. Um, the demand of the workforce has changed, but our supply is not. Fall River has always been home to mills and manufacturing and textile and fishing industries, and it was home to a blue collar workforce. And I don't need to tell you what the effect of retail trade has on our, on our local economy. Many of us work hard and often to spend our money at the local JCPenney or Walmart, but that money doesn't circulate. It gets sucked over to wherever the, the, the big wigs of the, the corporation live or where they want to live. So that money doesn't circulate throughout Fall River, New Bedford, or, or even the Bristol County. BCC should be a leader in the area by reintroducing vocational training, not only to increase small businesses, but to train the youth to be proud of their skills, even as a blue collar. Let's just take a moment to understand that the fact that not one of us would have air conditioning in our offices during the summer, or heat in the winter, not one of us would be able to go to the bathroom indoors, or even work when the sun was down if it wasn't for blue collar workers. As we consider our South Coast area, I realize that the closest in-state technical institution is over an hour away. For someone of poverty, that's just impossible. So we ask BCC as a leader in our state and in our area to reintroduce vocational training and to consider the possibilities of expanding the curriculum to meet our requests. And I'm going to give the floor to Kathleen Kirk for final comments. Thank you. So. Um, before I start my spiel, I'm going to give you guys a moment just to read um, the PowerPoint above me. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a few uh, points made in our presentation. The President's Honors Panel was charged with using the methods of problem-based learning to solve a current challenge that our college faces. President Spraga posed the question, what challenges to our service areas are associated with high levels of poverty, and what role should BCC play in addressing these challenges? As you have heard, um, the poverty line is the minimum level of resources that are adequate to meet basic human needs. We cannot forget that 22% of the individuals that live in our service area are at or below this line. Throughout this semester, this panel has worked to create comprehensive solutions that we believe will, tar er, will benefit the target population. Um, if you take anything away from this presentation, let it be this. Bristol Community College has the unique opportunity and responsibility to take action against this national epidemic. We believe that the solutions um, listed above will help to get individuals in the target populations out of poverty by getting them in the door. Throughout the community, outreach programs subsidize free courses that offer basic life skills um, that help this population with things that they desperately need, like uh, basic classes to get them out of, out of the cycle. Um, with goal-based achievement systems that involve coaches, the countless benefits of nationally recognized programs such as Single Stop and the promotion of vocational programs at Bristol Community College and local high schools, we can help to give them the opportunities, support, and resources needed to get them to graduate. Bristol Community College is in the business of keeping kids in school to complete their degree programs. Our solutions target individuals in the highest risk situations in the state. We are giving them every opportunity to become successful adults um, who will graduate and take with them the necessary life skills to not only break the cycle of poverty, but to enter into the workforce and better the lives of themselves and everyone around them. As we've explained, Bristol Community College is in this unique position and everyone in the service area will benefit. Um, we say that BCC changes the world by changing lives, learner by learner, um, and I can't think of a better group of people to start with. And we want to thank President Sprague for giving us the opportunity to be a part of this panel, and we hope that you have found this presentation to be informative. 
On behalf of myself and the entire class, we would like to say thank you for attending this presentation and hearing what we had to say and all of the hard work we have put in throughout this semester. And we'd like to open the floor for any questions, if you have any. Do you have a question? <coughs> oh, okay. Sorry. How has doing this project impacted you personally? Um, it could be in anyone that's had a, uh, a wow moment. It definitely changed our, my perspective, personally speaking. Um, I believe that people of poverty before I took the class, I, I believed that I, I followed the stigma associated with poverty that it was just people not working hard enough, and it it wasn't it wasn't that at all. You know, these people want to work, and sometimes they're just shortchanged. And I felt the same way too. I, I like I had the same negative stigmas in my mind. It's just people are lazy, they're abusing the system. But doing this, it made me realize that there's a lot of people that don't they don't want to be in poverty. They had good jobs, and things happened in their lives that put them below that poverty line. And they don't know that all these resources were out there. That's what the biggest thing for us was, was centralizing all these resources for people that need them, because it can be it, unbelievable. It can change their lives. To me, it was about uh, the entrapment, kind of, that poverty creates, because we've read, we read so many case studies. We read a great book um, called The American Way of Poverty by Sasha Bransky for a textbook. And it describes how people even working one or two jobs then didn't qualify for governmental support so they were back on the poverty line, even though they were working harder than ever. And they could barely afford food on the table, paying their rent, and how, you know, I, I would think that the government would provide at least the basic necessity. That was kind of my idea, and that some people were struggling, but the reality is most people are struggling just to scrape by, even with this governmental support and even getting a job. For me, the, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, for me, when, when I first started researching BCC and finding out everything that BCC had to offer, I grew up with a stigma, it's just a, it's just a community college, as though it was no great thing. And um, I've, I come from a family, and a lot of them have gone to colleges, and they took an Ivy League and look at things. And um, I came to BCC, and from coming here, well, you can't shut me up. I mean, I'm out there talking about everything and, and finding this program that this person would fit into. and um, it's just like kind of set me on a road and, and uh, I mean I just can't say enough of, of what this project meant to me. It, it ended up guiding what I did for a leadership project and um, it's just been unbelievable. It's just been absolutely unbelievable to be out there and, and to be with people and, and to find out you know most people that are in poverty don't want to be there and they're looking for alternatives and they're looking for outs and they're looking for someone to hear their side and you know, I see all the fears and, and everything that BCC does, and then there were still these people that were just, you know, whether it's generational poverty or new poverty, um, you know, because of the, the crashes and the stuff that hit, they need, they need to hear that, you know, what poverty is, what the awareness of it is, and, and what college has to offer, and especially BCC. And we have a large, large area here, and um, I'm out there telling them all, <laughs> you know? So. Right, and for me it was about that discussion. You know, as a child I came through poverty, and then as an adult with, with some of the things that happened in 2011, I crashed back into poverty. And I, I realized there was, a, there was a period where I thought nobody cared, and you know, how damaging that is, and that, that really, you know, impacts your psyche. But then when you involve yourself in a, in a group like this, you realize that it's about the discussion, and if we're gonna make an impact, we have to talk about it. And that, that's really what it's about. You know, for me that's what this was definitely about. Yeah, it was, it was definitely an interesting process for a lot of us. I think we all kind of got emotionally attached to the project. Um, we did journaling throughout our process, and that was a very, like, reflective, um, very, like... Therapeutic. Therapeutic <laughs> way. <laughs> therapeutic way to kind of go through this process. Because I think everybody had a different, you know, feel of going through it, and everyone had a different impact whether it was emotionally or someone that they knew and they didn't really see through that. So I think it's really important that, um, I don't know, that we observe that, that even through this, it was very emotional and we had times where we, you know, agreed and didn't, didn't agree. And, um, and that research is, is like that. 
and uh, it's very real. For myself personally, I'm, I'll admit, I'm at that stage where I feel like I'm under that line. And through the class, it's just brought a sense of self-strength. Okay, I'm at that point, but look, I'm not sitting there. I'm doing more. I'm looking into the situation. How can I get myself out? And just to say, okay, this is what's done, and this is the history, and this is what's going on around me, it makes me feel like I'm not the only one. And if I could be out there saying, okay, I'm at that line too, and look at where I am here. It's more of dragging everyone to BCC. You could come here. They, their doors are open. And being a, a, a teen mother that I, that I am, and it's, you can do it. It's not just because you're in poverty, what I got out of it, just because you're under, you're classified as you're in poverty, doesn't mean you're worthless. Doesn't mean that you can't achieve what everyone else has achieved because I'm not at an Ivy League school. Did you ever kind of raise earlier? Yeah, I was wondering what additional costs there are to a one-stop approach. <laughs> Single stop? <laughs> Single stop. Single yeah. stop. Is that a program that's national? Or? It is. It is a national nonprofit. What we got from our interview with Kathleen is we couldn't get into the logistics of what it's going to cost because they're going to use what BCC already has and just make it stronger. But one of the things that we were told, it's going to pay for itself. The money that comes in, it's not going to come out of the college's funds initially because you have tons and tons of companies out there who want to have this one place and support their, their fellow students. So that's the answer. There's, there's, there's a cost associated with the software. So Bend. yeah, the Bend is a, is a program that they use to answer those questions within 15 minutes to supply that information to somebody. So there is a, there is a cost associated with that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You talked about Um, well, for me personally, um, because of this class and because of my other civic engagement classes, I'm going into public policy um, and administration next year at school. So, that's, that's great. yeah. Anybody else? I think it's affected me um, as a whole, along with what everybody else has said, um, and also with our solutions. Just if we're positive about what we're doing here, regardless of whether we're in poverty, personally, I am way below that line. But just being positive and having a great outlook, educating people that you know these services are available and having a way for them to get it, I think that's just opened my mind along with the statistics and everything else that we've been talking about. In the future, I, I'm in psychology. I'm looking forward to doing that and to connect people in a mental health way. So it's it's going to stay close to me for the rest of my career. Okay. Uh, if I could say a couple things uh, on that question, building on that question, um, we we heard, thank you, we heard the diversity of your programs, and uh, I think now it's important that you go into your fields with this uh, selfless feeling that you have, and uh, uh, you're willing to to help and uh, bring it to your fields. And I think the, uh, all of us can say whatever field we're in, we need more of that. So I thank you for that and uh, what you've done. I thank you for this uh, wonderful study. It was very thoughtful. Uh, I, I particularly appreciate it. You didn't have easy answers like uh, everybody must volunteer or everybody must do this or that. It's, uh, it's got to be left up to the individual. Uh, the important thing, I don't want to take much time today, but uh, the important thing is that this study uh, not just sit uh, in my office or somebody's office and collect dust. Uh, you have very uh, uh, well laid out uh, six or seven thoughtful points and some subcategories within those points. And what I'd like to pledge to you is that um, we will begin to uh, form work groups on each of those points and see if we can expand on the work that you've done. To, it's pioneering work, really. Uh, this is, I think, the first presidential panel in the Commonwealth. And uh, I want to certainly thank uh, Professor Grady uh, for his initiative in uh, bringing this uh, to fruition. But I want to thank you, your pioneers, and uh, you may be leaving uh, BCC, I'm not sure when, but uh, whenever you, I don't want you to think that you didn't leave a mark when you, uh, when you were here. And it's going to have a lasting effect, I can tell right away from some of the things that you've mentioned, that we can, we can continue to expand on what you've, uh, what you've created and what you have, uh, have well thought out. 
Um, one thing that uh, I also appreciated was that we're not just, uh, and we need to work more, uh, we're not just talking about VCC students who, who we have to entice into a single stop or somewhere, uh, but we're also uh, expanding outward into the community to find uh, people who could benefit from BCC and don't know much about BCC um, and, uh, and the benefits that are, that are available. So we have a kind of a two-pronged attack, our own BCC family, existing family, and others that we can bring into the family uh, with the great work that, uh, that you have done. So you should be very proud and I'm very uh, honored to uh, have been associated with you as colleagues in learning. This is exactly the, the type of activity that I always had in mind when I met when I talk about colleagues in learning. So I thank you and Tom, I thank you for all you've done. If you wanted to say a few words. <laughs> it's all about them. It's all about them, absolutely. So uh, can we have a round of applause for everybody?